so smile. Okay, yeah. uh, go. Well, this is my way here, so yeah, this is something pretty unexpected that happened back in September, <coughs> um, and this led to a lot of work and a lot of uh, new scientific results um, that otherwise uh, we would have been putting out some relatively unread paper on the first observing run of the advanced value. But uh, now we've had, well, at this order of 12, 13 papers, I can't remember all of them. Um, so... Uh, Dr. Thomas, can you use the dot or the blackboard, please, on this side of the water? Say it again? Can you use this yes. side of the blackboard? Oh, yes. No, just, just walk, by Just walk, 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 yes. walk, walk. thank you. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> going to write down a few of the, the papers that uh, we published. Um, so. Firstly, the detection paper, the physical review letters that I assume everyone has read in detail. Uh, well, if not, you can ask me, uh, ask me questions about it. Uh, second, uh, description of the detectors at the time when the signal was, was seen. Third, the uh, unmodeled search pipeline, so uh, data analysis looking for generic uh, shapes of gravitational waves, and this was the first analysis that, that saw it. Uh, on the morning of this Monday in last September, and within a few minutes had people running down corridors and sending emails and wondering what was going on. Templated search, which uh, is designed to be an optimal uh, method to detect signals of the form that we know, and specifically signals produced by fluorescent binaries. Um, and this, is, this led to a, a determination that this was an extremely significant event that um, you would not expect to see something uh, equally much like a fluorescent binary signal from the detector noise, you know, even one, one in several hundred thousand years. Um, so the chance of getting such a result um, just due to random noise is incredibly small, so this allows us to um, put all of these feedback into the detection paper, but this allows us to um, tell the particle physicists that we've, we've got to find sigma, whatever that means, with only one event, which is not bad. Um, and okay, it helps that the one event is very large, but it also helps that uh, we're able to collect so much uh, background estimate um, from using the methods in this search. So yeah, maybe I'll write just one number next to each of these. So the detectors now why, why am I writing 80 megaparsec? The standard uh, we have the performance of the detectors is the average distance at which we could uh, detect the binary neutron star. So binary neutron star is obviously pretty light among the things that could possibly be giving us a signal. Um, and then average means average in all directions and average over all possible uh, orientations of the orbit. Um, so that's 80 megaparsec. Uh, compared to the initial detectors, that was the, la the last one of the initial detectors in 2010, um, that got to approximately 20 megaparsec. So, well, the detectors are maybe a factor four better 
and that means a factor of four cubed, more volume of the universe we're looking into. Um, our model search, so the number there is five minutes. That's the amount of time, approximate amount of time it took for uh, between the arrival of the signal of the det detectors to when it produced, uh, let's say, an alert to a human being. Maybe it's less than five minutes, I don't know the exact number. Um, so, one in, I think it's something like 300,000 years is the fossil alarm rate from this template for search. Um, the parameter estimation, um, I just get to quote one significant figure. The two masses of the two black holes are to one significant figure, 30, and they could be 35 and 25, but um, uh, we don't have great, well, we have a 10, plus or minus 10% error on that, which is actually not really good. Um, so, I skipped a bit, I mean, I skipped the bit where I, it, where I should have uh, pointed out to you that uh, we're very paranoid. Um, so, just because this, not just because this was at the beginning of the run, but speci especially because this was at, at the beginning of the run that the detectors had been being commissioned, which means people are uh, tuning various aspects of how they're set up to increase the sensitivity, and uh, measurements have just been done to make sure that we're able to calibrate the sensitivity correctly, and uh, there'd only been maybe one or two days of stable running of the detectors before this arrived. It wasn't even in the time when we were um, officially going to be saying that we were observing. So people were very suspicious that something weird could have happened at the detectors, or this could be some sort of official test put on by the management to see if we were awake. Um, in any case, lots and lots and lots of investigations were done to check that this was, uh, the detectors were behaving in a way that was uh, consistent with a real gravitational wave uh, producing the effect and not with anything else. So, detector characterization is what we call that, and there's a paper about that. I am, well, I'm not going to write another next to that because the result is just positive. <laughs> In terms of, well, ruling out anything else that could have um, caused well, this thing to appear in the detector outputs. Oops. So yeah, then it gets a bit hazy. Um, what is the seventh most important paper there? Well, I'm going to put um, rates because it's one that I worked on. Um, so based on not just the one very loud event, but on the collection of all the events seen in the first, let's say, um, five weeks or so of calendar time, which gives us 16 days of analyzable data. Um, so based on all, those, all the events seen in this templated search, uh, we do an uh, estimate of the number of um, binary black hole mergers per volume of space, per volume of the universe, per, per time. Um, and, okay, the basic calculation is very simple. You just count the number you saw in the detector and you divide it by the amount of space your detector is sensitive to. Um, and, and then you have an enormous amount of uncertainty because, firstly, you have Poisson statistics, you observed one, or, well, we also have a very quiet event which is kind of maybe slightly more likely to be a signal than not, but that gives us like, maybe 1.8 events, but then the error on that is pretty big. So I think the rate that we're quoting was two to four hundred um, per gigaparsec cubed per year. Um, and that is for all binary black holes in the universe, but that could possibly give us a, a signal that we see in our in the detectors. 
Um, and then, okay, we, all have, we also have a big uncertainty because we've observed one or very or possibly two, two events. Uh, that gives us very, very little just idea of what the mass distribution of black holes is. So then that's another big uncertainty in how much of the universe we are sensitive to. Um, so we have different ways of trying to account for this uncertainty, and this gives us this big, you know, this is more of, this is more than two orders of magnitude uh, difference between the lowest and the highest allowed rates. So, okay, this is, this rules out the most pessimistic um, estimates that you see zero, um, and, okay, there are also a few models in which you maybe expect to see less than two uh, mergers per gigabyte per year, but it's not a huge constraint on models as far as, well, maybe people here will, will disagree with that, but um, I, I don't think it's a huge constraint on models. But no, the 400 is towards the most optimistic end of what anyone could have predicted before uh, I get turned on. Well, eighth is completely different. It's tests of general relativity. Um, what this means is consistency tests of, again, this uh, measurement in the interferometer, so the, the time series that comes out of the interferometer, compared with the waveform that you predict using general relativity um, for a binary black hole merger with approximately these masses. So this is, uh, this is kind of a complicated uh, analysis to do. You have to account for all of the uncertainty in the parameters. You have to account for the uncertainty in the models of the waveforms because uh, you don't have necessarily the exact um, solution of GR uh, at all points. So uh, you have to have a good model of what the waveform uh, does. Um, so what sorts of deviations from GR could you have? Let's say, um, to get this, well, to get the prediction, so the prediction doesn't look like this. This is like full of noise, but prediction is like that. <coughs> if you imagine that, you're beautiful and smooth. Um, anyway, so the behavior towards the past is governed by a sort of energy, energy balance of the emission of gravitational waves. Um, so you emit gravitational waves, that takes energy away from the binary, uh, and that causes the binary uh, to, uh, the orbit moves in and the, the orbit speeds up. Um, so if, let's say, <coughs> the amount of gravitational waves emitted at any given point was different from what was predicted by GR, then the rate at which the frequency speeds up uh, would be different. So uh, that's, you can call that a deviation in the post-Newtonian coefficients of the, of the model. Um, so it's just, you know, rather than doing something like that, you could do something slightly different at one point and then the orbits will deface from one another and then that will give you a potentially detectable effect. Now, well, well, you don't know at the beginning of the system parameter. Say it again? Sorry? You don't know? Yes, indeed. I, yes. Uh, I, I, point, I said already that you have mm. to, uh, when you're doing this test, you already have to account for the fact that you don't know exactly the, the masses. So then you have to uh, account for, well, this dephasing could be caused by a change in masses or changing the spins. So you have to uh, rule out that, well, whatever whatever change you're seeing, you have to already ask yourself, well, could it be caused by the masses, or could it be caused by the spins? Mm -hmm. If not, then it could be caused by some mm -hmm. deviation from, from the GR, GR predictions. And then there are, well, there are various other consistency tests, um, and then there's also a bound on the speed of the graviton, uh, the velocity of the graviton, or well, dispersion relation, so let's say if different parts of this signal traveled towards us at different speeds, um, well, it would be a rather weird theory, but okay, deviations from GR are rather, basically rather weird theories anyway. Well, a massive graviton would do that. Yes, exactly. Um, <coughs> but okay, can you write down a consistent massive graviton theory? Um, it's pretty difficult. 
So, uh, suppose that you did have a theory in which uh, different <coughs> frequencies of gravitational waves travel at different speeds, then obviously if you had this waveform emitted at the source, uh, then by the time it reaches us, um, after how many million, hundreds of millions of years, um, it would look different. So, uh, there is a bound, and the bound of there is a bound of the wavelength of the graviton, let's say the Compton wavelength of the graviton, which is proportional to 1 over its mass, and that is greater than some ridiculously large number of um, mega parsecs, I think. I don't know the exact number. But it's pretty, you know, I think it's, I think it's the best bound on this, on this graviton dispersion relation so far. But don't quote me on that. Um, what else? There's a paper uh, <coughs> that was also written on the implications of this discovery for the stochastic background of gravitational waves. So this is... It's about a light year. Light year? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's not so great, I guess. <laughs> well, <It's> still big. <laughs> yeah. It's I think it's better than they did with solar system tests, but not by a bunch. Um, um, okay. So, stochastic background of gravitational waves is it's like, uh, rather than if you're, um, if you're picking up a radio signal or television signal and you can hear like, individual voices, individual <coughs> words, that's like seeing uh, a signal like that. If all you hear is just random noise, um, well, you can describe that as a stochastic um, signal. Now, the point about the stochastic signal is that uh, it looks like random noise, but it comes from the very far away universe. And how it's generated is by you know, many, 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 many different uh, sources, all producing signals, and then they overlap with one another to the extent that you can't tell, distinguish one from another. So then, now you go back far, far enough in the universe to redshift of maybe order of 10, um, the idea is that you have so many uh, binary black holes within this very large space, uh, very large uh, extended universe, that you have one binary black hole signal per a uh, few seconds, or even less than that, and then the signals will start overlapping one with one another, and then the sum of them produces some uh, apparently random noise uh, signal. And the way you would want to detect this is by having two detectors and each of them and then basically multiplying uh, the output of one with the output of the other or cross-correlating. So uh, in order to tell the difference between the random noise signal produced by binary black holes and the random noise in the detector, you need to uh, check basically between <coughs> two detectors, do they see correlations between the outputs. So, Basically, the fact that we see uh, a relatively high rate of relatively uh, massive binary black hole mergers tells us that there's a stochastic background that could be detectable with, let's say, third generation detectors. Um, so, uh, actually, um, would you mind expanding a little bit more on the process of detecting this background? So, as uh, you, the, the point you just made is that random noise would not be correlated between detectors as stochastic background would. Yeah. But it, it would seem to me to be a, a, a different challenge than determining you have an individual signal because yeah. the individual blips will not be particularly significant. And even, I, I would have imagined that the individual correlations between blips would not be sure. easily seen. So you sub it over the entire amount of data you have. So, um, yeah, so one way of doing it is to take the two detector streams and, okay, if you whiten them, you correct for the fact that you have, uh, uh, you don't have just white noise from the de detector. Um, and then you take, you, know, you work out what is their, their cross correlation as a function of the time shift between the two streams. Um, so, the time shift would be different depending on the origin. Mm. Yeah. 
you know, you know. Uh, but okay, the time shift, but well, you have to do two detectors 4,000 kilometers apart. If, uh, if a particular, <coughs> and the, the stochastic signal arriving from a particular direction will essentially look the same in both detectors. Uh, so when, the, when you reach the appropriate um, time shift uh, concerning uh, for, the, for the direction in uh, of arrival you're thinking of, then the correlation should, should go way up. And if for different time shifts, you get much smaller correlation of zero. Um, yeah, if, you take the, if you take the two detectors uh, outwards and uh, cross-correlate them with a time shift of uh, greater than 10 milliseconds, then essentially you, you expect uh, no correlation at all because that's greater than the possible, largest possible uh, travel time between the two detectors. But to follow up a little bit on, on the point that you just made, if we were to do the, the time shift correlation, would you expect essentially, you know, whatever the baseline pure noise level it is, larger than 10 milliseconds separation, so basically from yeah. minus 10 to plus 10 in some sense, in all sense. Yeah. And then would you expect something that's like growing, like a sine wave? Because if you've got a zero time delay, that band has the largest area on the sky, yeah. that's smaller at 10 and so on. So would you expect basically this form, and how do you, how do you incorporate all the information yeah, sure. Um, well, this uh, <laughs> this is something. <laughs> I can, there's I, a whole theory about. That. Yeah, I, mean, I can say because I have the, I share an office wall with Joe Romano, so I can <laughs> talk to him a little bit about this. Yeah. There's also you have an overlap reduction function between the two different detectors, which is also frequency dependent. Mm -hmm. And so you do it in, I believe you do it in in, in frequency space, and you're looking at correlations that follow the overlap reduction function as you go through the different frequencies. Okay. Okay, and then if I could follow up on yet another question related to this. Let's suppose that the universe of black holes is in fact dominated for some ungodly reason by 30 and 30. So yeah. that's black holes. And then you, you look at the rate you have there, and it'll, it'll say round up to 100 per cubic day parsec per year. Yeah. And we think, what is the volume of the universe out to, say, a redshift of one? And that redshift, that volume of the universe is, is something on the order of 200 cubic gigaparsecs. Yep. It's not actually obvious to me that what you really have is a constant no. hum of noise. In fact, it seems like, given the short duration of this event, and then, of course, if you redshift it, it's going to be even shorter duration frequency range of interest? Uh, no, no, you redshift the, the signal, you, you know, this is, you, know, you put the signal to larger distance, it's redshift is relative to us, so it lasts yes. longer in the detector frame. The frequency, however, is lower, Yes. which means that the frequency, so the, the time spent in, in, in the frequency range of interest, like the 100 hertz type of high sensitivity is, is going to be minimal at that stage. So, it's, so it, it seems that the the ideal of having a constant hum is not going to be achieved. Certainly not how to redshift over the one. No. And uh, then, but then even if you get a higher redshift, then you're out of band, right? Well, this is why you also need third generation detectors, which have lower, lower frequency cutoffs, or, um, or these are. But, do, but didn't the LIGO stochastic paper say that there was actually a prospect of, of getting a stochastic background from an in and past LIGO? It's possible. I mean, you, know, you have to be quite optimistic. So yeah, you have you also have a model of the star formation rate, which uh, you take the, the rate in the local universe, and presumably the, the amount of star formation increased up to lower, up to higher redshifts. Um, and then you have some. Uh, you don't just assume everything is 30-30. You have some population of different masses. Um, yeah, I have. In my opinion, like you know, 15 years speculative in the future. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't going to say anything specific. About it. Um, I mean, it would be exciting if it's if it uh, if ever, anyone ever sees it, but uh, I think that is um, that's the sort of recent time scale. If not, uh, recent technology. Um, okay. Maybe 
probably the last, last paper I will say anything specific about this is the EM follow-up, which uh, this is a program that was put in place um, in the years just before uh, advanced LIGO that if some, uh, if these low latency, so pipelines that run directly on the data as soon as it's collected and produce results within a few minutes, um, if these uh, see something that looks interesting in some way, then the program is that it will be, in principle, rapidly checked, and then the sky location, as far as you can determine it, is uh, estimated from, well, from various uh, properties of, of the signal, which I'll try <coughs> maybe go into in a little, more, little bit more detail um, later, and then uh, the sky location uh, should be sent up to maybe uh, order 50 uh, groups of astronomers who, um, if they're fairly interested in this, will point the telescopes. Uh, and if the telescopes are able to point towards that area of the sky, and if it's not um, blazing sunlight at that point, uh, we'll try to observe that, that portion, of, portion of the sky. Um, this was the way that this happened, given that this was the beginning of a side turn, given that this was um, pretty obviously a black hole signal, so this was not the um, prime target as far as objects producing electromagnetic radiation, basically uh, supernovae and neutron stars, uh, binaries with neutron stars were concerned. It took some days for the collaboration to decide to actually send out but it was done, and then uh, large numbers of telescopes were appointed, and then, um, well, essentially nothing, uh, nothing that looked like a clear counterpart was seen, which uh, is not necessarily uh, surprising, but I think this is a good proof of principle that should sure things with neutron stars occur, we're uh, quite well placed to, to try and uh, get some multi-messenger science out of them. Um, so, okay, there are yet more papers, <laughs> which are probably less relevant to this workshop, um, but this is, uh, this is the basic list. So, uh, rather than just having, let's say, one paper about the operation of the detectors and one paper with upper limits on everything, um, this has been keep, keeping us busy for the last six months or so. <coughs> So, maybe to, I can highlight one or two specific points in this big list of, of stuff um, to keep us busy for the next uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Well, it's up to you, uh, my, yep. we say one hour, but it's, uh, it's a lie. I mean, it's up okay. to you. You can take sure. two hours, but it's, if we're interested. It's, it's, also, it's also up to you. Uh, <laughs> That uh, if there's some, if there's uh, one of these one of these topics that you think uh, you really don't, don't think you understand well enough, or you'd like to, to have more details on, I can probably try and uh, provide more details on that. I, I'm certainly going to talk more about the detector because that's something that um, no one here knows about, with possible exception of that. <laughs> um, and I'm certainly going to talk about parameter estimation because that is really a direct input to uh, this workshop. Um, but the other ones, uh, that would take the whole day and I don't, I don't think I would survive the whole day. So I would certainly be interested in your personal opinion, not as a representative of the LIGO scientific collaboration, <laughs> of what, based on O1, are likely to be the greatest instrumental challenges to eventually oh. get into advanced line of sensitivity. Right. Well, I'd better draw a nice diagram of the detector to uh, have some slight chance of being able to answer this. Okay, let's have the laser. That's my diagram of the laser. Um, <laughs> so, let's have frequency 1064 nanometers. Um, this isn't any special magic number. Um, well, it's the frequency at which you can make an incredibly stable 
high power laser, so stabilized frequency, <coughs> stabilized in amplitude, and you do that simply because any um, variation over time in the frequency or amplitude of the laser is just going to feed into the detector noise further down, uh, further down the line. And also, you can make extremely highly reflective mirrors for this uh, for laser particle frequency. So, what happens to it then? Well, you have all sorts of um, technical stuff to make the lights uh, beautiful and focused in exactly the beam you want. I'm not going to show that, but. So that's the Y arm of the detector. X arm, and that's the output. And then we have another mirror here. So if we forget, if we forget about all these mirrors and you know, all these extra junk around the beam splitter, so uh, this is the beam splitter that makes it into an interferometer in the first place, um, all you have is, let's see, and then this, this little line is my representation of the whole incredibly complicated suspension system. Um, so, let's say it's a spring. <laughs> and then, this is at right angles, so you have to assume this is, that is the local vertical of the white arm, so uh, both, both of the end mirrors are suspended vertically on springs. Um, so the point is that they are free to move in the horizontal direction along the axis of the laser beam. So what you have is just a Michelson interferometer. And then what you measure is the time variation in the difference between the two paths. So, something called the strain in the detector, um, and then the thing we're trying to measure. So, the length, this is the length of the X arm, that's the length of the Y arm from the end mirror to the um, beam splitter, if this was just a Michelson. Delta Y, P, all divided by L bar, and then L bar is the mean length, or time average length, which is 4 kilometers. Now, yeah, a nice way of thinking about it is, well, we don't actually measure length differences, what we measure is differences in the time of flight of the photon uh, going from, to and from the end mirror, to and from that end mirror, um, so differences in the time of flight between the two arms. And, okay, if you have a gravitational wave, it's not going to necessarily produce a measurable uh, strain in the detector. You need to have a gravitational wave uh, arriving in a direction with a polarization such that you have an actual uh, non-zero difference between the responses of the two arms. So you, you know, you've all seen this like rings of test particles If you imagine a gravitational wave going into the board, then uh, you have something called the plus polarization, which causes, um, let's say, test particles which are further up in the y direction to go even further in the y direction, and test particles um, which are displaced in the x direction to go in the negative x direction. So. <coughs> In this, that, in this case, you have the maximal sensitivity of the interferometer to this gravitational wave, or you have something called the plus, polar, the plus polarization, in which uh, this test particle here, well, let's say this test particle here, um, is displaced in the y direction, 
and well, the x and the y direction uh, positively, and it gets displaced even further. This one is displaced uh, positively in x, negatively in y, and that uh, gets its distance to the origin shrunk. This test particle and this one just lie along the x and y directions, and they just sit where they are, so they don't get displaced at all. Um, so if one of these cross-polarized uh, gravitational waves arrived at the detector, you wouldn't see it at all. Um, and you, know, you also imagine if a gravitational wave arrived from the 45 degrees direction, uh, no matter what uh, polarization it had, it turns out that uh, the x and y arms would see the same change in length. So you, know, you have zero sensitivity also for something arriving 45 degrees in the plane of the detector. So uh, this all this leads to something called a peanut, um, which is uh, if you imagine the detector just sitting on the Earth like that, you have different sensitivities to gravitational waves arriving from different directions, so roughly if the uh, radius of this is proportional to the amplitude of the strain seen for a gravitational wave arriving in this or that or that direction, um, and it's not just a, it's not just a circularly symmetric peanut, it's a peanut with sort of dimples in it. <laughs> so there's like four dimples in four directions in which the um, gravitational, in which the detector is insensitive in, its, in the plane where it lives, um, but then uh, overhead, directly overhead and directly uh, towards the floor, the, the dimples sort of smooth out, so you have a more uniform sensitivity if for gravitational waves arriving overhead and from, from the, the ground. Essentially, this means that almost all of the so sources that we see, um, that we see to be detectably strong will come from more or less overhead the detectors and relatively few sources that we detect will be in the plane of the detectors. Um, now there's two of them as well. So um, I'm not going to try and draw a map of the United States, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Well, okay, I lied. This is the... Um, you got to stick Texas and Florida in there. Yes, Florida. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this, okay. Alaska. <laughs> Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> New England. Clear? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, we certainly need the, the Gulf of Mexico because that's where. Uh, now, one of them is situated here in the, the sort of high plains desert and close to nuclear reservation, well, I don't know, nuclear uh, waste site. Um, one of them is detected as uh, located here in the swamp. Um, these beautiful locations chosen because they are federal land and so easily available. And also to be a long distance apart, such that uh, if you have, let's say, an earthquake on the west coast here, um, it affects one, de one detector well before the other. Um, and you know, if there is some local atmospheric disturbance or electrical disturbance, it is very unlikely to affect both of them at the same time in the, in the same way. So I believe the approximate orientations of the arms are like that. Um, this is for is it 3,000. Yeah, 3,000. What's that? Well, it's 10 milliseconds. Um, so what you note is, well, they're almost, one of the arms is almost aligned along the line joining them, and you know, if you imagine that for a moment the United States is flat rather than curved on the face of the Earth, um, they would basically be almost at right angles to each other if you move them next to each other. So what this means is, okay, and the they are both 90 degrees. <laughs> so what this means is, okay, if you have, if you flip this detector by 90 degrees, or well, if you flip the Y arm to be a minus Y arm, basically you've 
flip the strain h of t to be minus h of t. So if we go to this like, simplified world in which they were both exactly in the same plane, uh, you expect, uh, this is Livingston, detector L1, this is Hanford, detector H1. Um, you expect for some for gravitational wave that's arriving from overhead of both of the de detectors. Um, you expect one of the strains to be basically opposite, equal and opposite to the, uh, the other. And that's what's been done on this t-shirt. <laughs> so this is sort of um, really basic, simple-minded, coherent data analysis that you take the two uh, strain measurements and you flip the sign in one of them and you check if they're the same. <laughs> now, this is not what, what any of our analysis pipelines actually do, but if you have a um, strong enough signal, um, well, this is what you expect for most directions in which the wave could, could arrive at the detectors. Now, in reality, you know, they are separated by 3,000 kilometers, they're on the surface of the Earth, uh, the Earth is curved, so they're not exactly in the same plane and they're not exactly at 90 degrees. Now, what this tells you as well is that we can't determine whether the wave is circular. Well, I forgot to tell you about circular polarization. That's <coughs> difficult to draw on the blackboard. But essentially, circular polarization is a combination of the plus and the cross, with the cross like delayed by, uh, I think it's a quarter of a cycle relative to the plus. So then, your ring of test particles, rather than just going uh, in and out and in and out, will kind of uh, you imagine an ellipse, and the ellipse is just rotating around and around and around. Um, so, circularly polarized uh, gravitational wave is what we expect from uh, the majority of compact binary sources. Um, and they have, uh, that has the nice feature that um, <coughs> as, long as, uh, as long as you're not in one of these complete blind spots of the detector, um, you're always going to see some non-zero amplitude of the waves. But, uh, the fact that the detectors are very uh, close, uh, nearly co-aligned with each other, means that we can only extract like one of these polarizations. So, uh, I've drawn them at 45 degrees, this, this, uh, these would extract the cross polarization, um, and they wouldn't tell you whether the incoming wave, well, let's see if it's perpendicular to the ball, they wouldn't tell you if the incoming wave had any plus polarization. If the people who designed LIGO had instead put the detectors like that, so one of them at 45 degrees, one of them at 90 degrees, um, then this one would get the cross polarization, this one would get the plus polarization, and then you'd be able to determine uh, what is the relative strength of the different <coughs> polarizations the wave. Uh, and, okay, if in hindsight um, well, we knew that most of our sources would be, or could be, from our binaries, maybe uh, this would have been a slightly better way of, of setting it up. But, this way of setting it up has the great advantage that uh, if some random disturbance occurs, then you have this extremely easy but extremely straightforward uh, consistency check between the two detectors, um, rather than, no, an uh, unmodeled gravitational wave could have a completely different form in the plus versus the cross polarization. I mean, it's sort of impossible, but um, uh, if you see if you see different forms of the wave in the cross and polar, the plus polarization, you don't necessarily expect there to be this simple uh, consistency check. Okay, so our big problem here is, well, if you imagine just this Michelson and nothing else, basically um, this is not going to be very sensitive, even if you have a ridiculously high-powered laser. What we want to get is uh, H of T approximately 10 to the minus 23. So, yeah, we have four kilometers 
Um, so that means we need the displacement, well, we need to be able to measure the displacement of the mirror with two approximately 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 20 uh, precision. Uh, that's quite difficult. So that's 10 to the minus 19 and 10 to the minus 20 meters. So I'm not going to go into all of the aspects of, of how this is done, but uh, these extra mirrors give you some idea of what's going on. So first, rather than just Michelson, you have uh, resonant cavity, so fabri perm interferometer, you can call it. You essentially have a resonant cavity between um, two mirrors in each arm, where the laser power builds up. And this um, gives you a factor, an approximate 300 uh, improvement in sensitivity over your basic Michelson. And you so can think of this. The finesse of this uh, yeah, this is well. This is the approximate finesse. This is three hundred. Um, this means that every for every photon that goes in, you have three hundred <coughs> photons just uh, sitting inside the cavity, or or equivalently, um, well, every photon stays in the cavity three hundred times as long as it would have done if you just um, had the simple Michelson. So instead of an arm length of four kilometers. Um, this gives you an effective arm length of uh, order of 1,000 kilometers. So, so you, um, in lab you can achieve, say, 10,000 in events, so what's the difficulty? In so, this case? Yes. so in, in laboratory we can get up to, say, 10,000 yeah. in events. In this case we have only 300, so what's the... Uh, so, no, if you keep the photon in the, in the cavity for a very, very long time, um, you'll start cancelling the gravitational wave against itself. So if you keep it in the cavity for more than one gravitational wave cycle, um, uh, you actually start reducing the sensitivity of, of, the, of the interferometer to high, um, the high frequency gravitational waves. And well, also, uh, the more laser power you have in the cavity, the more heat you have deposited on the mirrors, then you have, uh, if you heat the mirrors, you create thermal noise, and you creates distortion and there's a finite amount of um, well let's see. I mean there's a finite amount of heat that, that you can deal with in the current technology and still keep everything uh, beautifully can you have two FP in one arm? Say that again? Can you two have two FP capitals in one arm? Two who? Yeah. Uh, where would you put them? Just along the arm you put two capitals. But in in series in parallel or stick a mirror maybe between them and, yeah. and then combine the beam again um, huh? somewhere you mean probably stick a little something like this in parallel yeah um, and then you combine this again before you put just a mirror I think this would be equivalent to having a larger mirror well but then you have less uh, heat distortion well I mean well, we already make the mirrors as large as we can, consistent with the beam. Well, this leave, these all live inside vacuum tubes. The vacuum tubes were built in the 1990s, I think. Yeah. Um, no, we, it's, it's somewhat like a CERN that, um, well, okay, the net tunnels were reused for the LHC. In this case, the, the, the vacuum tubes were uh, initial LIGO were reused for advanced LIGO. I think basically you can't make the mirrors any larger without, without getting in the way of the, of the vacuum tubes, but at least without the beam uh, threatening to, to collide with the, with the edge of the tubes. And I'm wondering if you might end up with mirror correlations on the suspensions if you had more than one mirror. Oh, well, yeah, I think this would make the whole thing much more difficult to control yeah. anyway. Um, but no, for third generation detectors, people are looking at much larger um, beam sizes, at least for for some elements in those detectors and, and larger uh, mirror sizes. So, yeah. As, as to why you can't increase, increase the finesse arbitrarily, I'm not sure exactly the reason of this. I think it's in the paper. Um, so, to, I mean, to, to follow up on that, uh, this question, in principle, if you had finesse of a thousand, you could have your, your housing and everything a third as large, but would the problem be what you were just describing, that the higher finesse leads to 
larger contained laser power that's happening in this the thermal distortions? Is that the fundamental reason why it's good to have a long cavity? Uh, oh, that's, that's a complicated question. Uh, well, you have a long cavity in part because you have displacement noise. So uh, there's, let's say, one reason, one reason why you're concerned about this is the Earth is, as I said, not flat. So you have some element of vertical noise that is vertical displacement of the mirrors that is transmitted into uh, displacement along the beam, um, along the direction of the beam. And even with this uh, wonderful technology, which I just, um, well, this suspension technology suppresses the, the seismic noise by, I think, 10 orders of magnitude. Um, that's already an incredible uh, technical feat. Um, but still, uh, you have a lot of you have a lot of technical challenges in keeping the mirrors uh, freely falling in the direction of the beams, but otherwise stable. Um, and you have other noise sources in the mirrors, uh, mainly thermal noise, and that uh, acts as well. The reason it, this gets into the detector output is well, thermal noise means fluctuations of uh, phonons within the mirrors, which cause, uh, cause the surface of the mirror to vibrate, and then that messes up your measurements of, of, the, of the length. Um, but it messes them up to an extent which is proportional to one over the length of the arms. So the larger you make, uh, the longer the make, you make the arms, the less these displacement noises uh, feed into your output. So that's one reason why you about four kilometers. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it was a reasonable compromise between um, cost of building them and sensitivity. You were saying though that the signal recycling gives you an effect. Okay, so this, you have the uh, fabric power cavity, you have power recycling, so first you also have this mirror in front of the beam splitter, which it, uh, increases the power in the whole thing by about in fact, 35. So, okay, out of the laser you get 20 watts, at least 20 watts was the, in, the power that was put out by the laser in the, the one that we've had so far. So if you think of the interferometer as basically a mirror, so uh, virtually no light gets out here at the measurement port. So uh, you put an extra mirror here and the laser light just keeps on uh, oscillating, well, keeps on being reflected back and forth between the signal re uh, power recycling mirror and the rest of the interferometer, then they get an extra factor of 30 something out of this as well. Um, then also you have the signal recycling mirror. Um, signal recycling increases the sensitivity by some factor and also uh, changes the frequency response of, of the uh, detector in a way that I'm uh, not going to try to, you try to explain. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a, a lot of there's a lot of trade-offs between these different choices made, and uh, this is just what the configuration has been chosen for the initial um, run of the detector. In, uh, as, as you said, uh, people will have to be have to work uh, quite hard in the next years to get this for the factor of three or so to get to full advanced sensitivity. Uh, but part of that will be increasing this 20 watt input to 200 watts. So uh, there will be quite a lot of technical challenges in absorbing all this extra power and dealing with all this, all this extra heat that's going to go through beam splitter and the, and the cavities. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's designed uh, to be able to, to absorb this in the end. So, and there are, well, what stopped us going above 20 watts? Initially, I think one answer is uh, keeping the whole thing under control. So there's already some uh, instabilities that kick in. Um, basically, for example, the mirrors have vibrational modes. Um, and then if you, and then uh, if you have some, um, if the shape of the beam varies, let's say, and you can excite something, instability, you can excite some vibrational motion mirrors, 
And then if you have enough power in the arms, you can get some, in what uh, turns out to be some positive feedback, which basically, um, if you let it build up for too long, will break the interferometer, well, not break, but you know, cause it to, be, to no longer be resonant. Um, so this, this is um, basically called parametric instability, and you have to tune the parameters um, the way the optical setup is, is done to um, quite carefully to avoid that this happens. Um, and then when you increase the power, there's lots more modes that could possibly cause parametric instability, so uh, you have to spend you know, proportionally much more time thinking about how to avoid it and making sure it actually works in practice. So it's time for me to draw a well, well, one stupid question. Yep. Can you exploit these parametric instability to enhance the, uh, the signal? Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you want your detector to be linear in the signal, and I mean, the, point, uh, the, in the instability is something that, that grows exponentially and uh, eventually. to have a sort of uh, oscillatory, um, adapt oscillatory 